reminded just of the power of music, um, any type of music, of, of, of how it speaks into our lives and, and so often can um, be there to remind us of a greater truth. And I remember that song, we, we sang it on my final su- Sunday here uh, a year ago, and just being again um, incredibly moved but also reassured. Um, and it's a song that continues to come up in my life. And, and I often think of that first verse, in, in Christ alone, my hope is found. And in many ways, this is a, a song that I would say is, is a good theme song for, for what I was talking about last week and what we're going to continue um, here this morning. As we look at this reality of where do we find hope? Where do we find hope? Is, is it in the things that, that happen to us, the, the situations or the circumstances we find ourselves in? Or is it in something greater? Because we often find in life that we don't always have control over everything that happens to us. We, <laughs> if you're like me, I certainly wish I did, but we don't. And so it constantly pushes me to be reminded that there needs to be a greater hope so that when life doesn't go according to plan, I have a greater hope in knowing that God is with me. Or when life goes according to what I think is the plan and everything's going really well, it draws me back in again and reminds me, don't place your hope in the things of the world, in good things of this world that God's given to us. Right? Family, health, relationships, a great job, finances, whatever the good things may be, God is always telling us, don't put your hope in those things. Put your hope in me so that when difficulties come, you will still have hope. And when life is is going incredibly well, you'll know that your life is not rooted in them. And so last week, if you were with us, we, we talked about this reality of hope, I believe, is being foundational, not in what happens to us, but rather in knowing that God is always with us. Because it's easy to forget It's easy to think sometimes that based upon what happens in life may be God's view of us. That if things are going well, as I or or things are not going well, as I shared with those those men and women in prison, that you can begin to think that not only has the world forgotten me, but God has forgotten me as well. And there's nothing further from the truth. That God gives us these images throughout the Bible to remind us. And the image we got from the prophet Isaiah last week is when God says, I've engraved you in the palms of my hands, pointing us to a greater reality in Jesus Christ. For us to know that if you ever wonder, does God care about you? Does, does God remember you? Just look to the cross. And that's why I come back to this song in, in Christ alone. And so this morning, we want to take it the next step. To the place of saying, if I have this hope in my life, is this a hope that I just hold on to? Is this, is this where it ends? Because I want to suggest that regardless of where you are in life, regardless of what stage you are in, whether you are older or whether you are, are younger or whether you're kind of in the middle, Regardless of where you are in your pathway of faith, whether you're someone who has followed God and and believes in Jesus and, and wants to order your life around him, or you're someone that is still not really sure about this, still asking questions, I want to suggest that regardless of where you are, I believe we share this in common. We want to make a difference. We want to make a difference. We want our life to count for something. So that life is not just simply about, well, I'll live my life and I'll do my thing. I think if you start to think about it, the way in which we treat others, the way in which we, we handle our families, the way in which we interact with neighbors and coworkers, the, the, the way we spend our time, we want to make a difference. I mean, we don't want to come towards the end of life and look back and then think, well, what what has this all been about? And the amazing thing is that's because I believe that's how God has wired us. He wants us to make a difference in this world. 
And so this morning, we're going to look at the question of, of hope that God gives to us is not a hope that we just hold on to, but it is a hope that when we've experienced it in our life, it begins to motivate us so that we can have the trickle-down effect that we begin bringing hope into the lives of others. And so this morning, we're going to look at this question of, of not, can we make a difference? Not, do I want to make a difference? But how does it work? How do we begin to put some, some practical handles on hope so that we can carry it around with us and give it to others? And so I've called in a friend. I've called in a favor this morning. More than a friend. I've invited Rebecca to come and join me here this morning um, because some of the things I'm going to be talking about is slightly above my pay grade, and so I need experts to come in and share with me. Um, Rebecca, come on up here. Obviously, none of you got the memo. It's, it's, it's spouse matching day today. Um, this was given to us on probably our second or third Sunday, um, and so we'd often come to church on times, and the entire congregation um, would be decked out in clothes like this. So I know a good tailor. We can get some fabric. We can talk about it, right? We can see how it goes. There'll be like five people at church next week, right? Those really enthusiastic ones there else has been like, I don't know what happened to Joel in Malawi, but he's gone crazy. Um, and so Rebecca and I are just going to have a little conversation, um, partially about what she was doing while she was in Malawi. Um, and then so hopefully when she's finished, we can just figure out some next steps for all of us um, as we desire, I believe, uh, to make a difference. And so I'm going to grab you a, a mic here. You want to sit or stand? Um, All right. So, so Rebecca, if you can just begin by, by sharing uh, the various ministries that you were involved in this past year. And so obviously, Rebecca was much busier than I was uh, this past year. Uh, we can't cover everything, and so I wanted to focus right on uh, Tids the Lorana, and that was in the same community uh, where we went to church. And so um, can you tell us a, a little bit about uh, Tids the Lorana and, and the things that would happen there? And so I had a chance to um, go on occasion and to see the things that were happening. Um, but what were some of the obstacles, um, some of the challenges uh, that, that you faced that were just the everyday reality of working with these people? It's, 
it's also run by Malawian volunteers. So it's it's only the mission book that has sort of been the partner between the funder in Canada and bringing those funds to Malawi and to the Malawian partners that run it. Um, I knew of the program when we were in Malawi last time, and to be honest, I stayed as far away as possible. I did not want anything to do with this program. I had heard the stories of the types of things that people saw there and what was going on, and I didn't want any part of it. Um, so to be honest, it was when they told me that this was going to be in my portfolio of work items, I was not, not too impressed, um, but that's what you get when you agree to, uh, to work in various different areas. So, um, I think the horror stories were about as bad as I envisioned them to be. Um, oh, I'm going to get emotional. <laughs> um, this is why I brought my little Masika's purse, actually, filled with um, Kleenexes. <laughs> um, people crawling on hands and knees, um, grandmothers carrying full-grown children um, that were disabled. Anyways, you've seen the World Vision commercials, so you know what it's like. It's pretty much like that. Um, really severe disfigurement um, because there's no physio services and um, just really like crazy disabilities. And so I think the challenge for me was feeling completely under my depth. Um, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a physio or a nurse. <laughs> so those would have been very practical skills to have had in that program. I had none of those skills. Um, so those were some of the challenges. Um, I mean, also, I think just then the comparison between what I came having and between what people have in Malawi, it's just really difficult to um, be able to think about. We just have so much here in Canada. I have so much in my life, and they have so little. Um, you know, they don't have any mats to sleep on, so keep going with the mat for them. <laughs> um, they, lots of the kids didn't have shoes. People are chronically hungry and malnourished. Um, it's just really desperate, um, desperate situations. So very difficult. And so, what would be, I think, helpful is to understand. I mean, in in facing this daily reality, um, what were you able to do? How were you able to step beyond these challenges, um, the sense of being overwhelmed, and being engaged? What 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 are some practical things that? you are doing? Yes. So, um, I think the two ways that I, over time, be able to, was sort of able to deal with the, with the reality of the situation that I was in, um, two things. One was in just maybe identifying the gifts and skills that God had given to me, none of which were medical, which would have been so practical. Um, and I have skills in administration, I think, and organizational structure. And so this program actually, when I arrived, was just um, probably about to lose their funding because they were very, the Malawian volunteers, although they were, they were wonderful field people and they were wonderful on the ground, they were really struggling with being able to keep up with the donor requirements that we have in Canada. Um, we have very stringent requirements with um, how we account for money if we're going to send it overseas, which is great, but they were having trouble with reporting and keeping their finances on track. And so I was um, able to step into that gap and um, sort of be a bridge between the partner on the ground and the donors back in Canada. So we were able to refund the program for another two years. Um, so I felt that um, I was able to identify sort of where I could be of use and, and jump into that gap, even though I did feel completely sort of overwhelmed and out of my depth initially. And I think then the other thing that really helped was just, instead of just being overwhelmed by the complete amount of need, um, was being able to just focus on a few individuals that touched my heart for one reason or another. I don't know whether or not God had pointed them out to me or whether or not they just sort of grabbed my attention um, because of their particular circumstance. Um, so we're going to show a couple pictures of two of, the, two of the people that I was particularly involved with. So this is Iverson, and when I first started going, um, to the club, he was just a little kid that I had engaged with. We had this little box of toys and we had those like stars and hearts and things, circles that you would put, you know, you fit into the holes in the box and I played that game with him a couple, a couple weeks, putting these things into the box and he was quite alert even though he was quite um, 
uh, handicapped, he was able to do that with my help. And so we had this little connection and um, his family got into some terrible circumstances over the next few months. And so he started coming to the club and looking much more malnourished. Um, he became very concerned with just how thin he was and really um, thinking that he probably would die of malnourishment actually. So, um, we got involved, the volunteers and I, and social welfare in the community were able to get him help, him and his family help. We got him set up in a shelter where he was doing feeding, or he was getting fed every day, um, and getting some support, getting the family support, getting the family some money, and groceries, and do we have the after picture here? We do. Yeah, we have a second so picture then, there. Just before I left, this is Iverson, and um, such a cute little guy, I and mean, obviously had put on much more weight, he was smiling, he was happy, and it was just um, such a testimony to, um, you know, people pulling together as a community, um, enabling him to be helped and getting him through a really difficult time with his family. And, um, and so, anyways, great circumstance. Um, the other person that I put up here is Calista, and I had, um, with the funding that we had from PWSMB, we were able to dabble in all kinds of things, actually, so again, not my, not my expertise, but we had some money to get people prosthetics. There was a lot of people without limbs and um, that had no legs, no working legs, I don't know, various, all things you can imagine, but Calista was a little girl that was 13. Her mom had been carrying her on her back. She had no legs from the knees down. I'm sure there's a medical term for that. And so she'd always walked on stumps, um, but she was very proficient. So super cute little girl, um, nothing wrong with her except her legs. And, and she was great at flying around on, on these legs, short little legs, but she had always felt, um, you know, not up to what her classmates were doing. There's no special schools at all in Malawi, really, for people, you know, that had different needs. So she was just in regular school. Um, and so we were able to take her to the hospital and get her fitted for prosthetics. So in her case, because of her particular disability, the prosthetics were able to fit, like she just had like knees and kneecaps, I guess. They were able to fit right under her kneecaps. <clears throat> and she put them on and the doctor said, said, you know, this is gonna take a long time and we're gonna have to do physio. It's gonna take many weeks for her to be able to walk. And she put these prosthetics on after a couple of weeks of appointments and doctors were waiting and waiting. She put them on and within three hours she was completely walking. Completely walking. So excited. Huge smile on her face. Her mom was clearly thrilled. I mean for her but also not to have to carry her on her back everywhere. Like there's no roads in Malawi that are comfortable for walking on. It's all dirt paths and dirty so it's just amazing. Why don't we um <clears throat> why don't you sh why, don't, why don't we show you Calista? Here's a here's a before and then an after. So there she is before, and another little guy I was involved with is the guy crawling there. So this was on our way to the appointment where we'd already been fitted for everything, and then. She was going to put them on her legs. So helping them in the car there is Gibson, one of the most amazing Malawian volunteers ever, a retired guy who helped out nonstop with this program, advocating for people, bringing them to the hospital, helping their families. Anything you can possibly imagine he was involved with doing, it was amazing. And so let's show the second video. She's fully walking and her mom's behind there with a huge smile on her face. So that was like a very incredible moment for, for me. And again, sort of one of those things you're like, wow, if only one thing was accomplished this year, it was so worth it even just to have her being able to walk. So I think one of the ways that we were able to not be overwhelmed by the, by the scale of need and um, what was going on in the rally was just to focus on the few little things that we can do, the story of the starfish, which I'm sure all of you have heard, you know, there's millions on the sand, and then you just pick that one and throw it back in. Um, that was, I think, how we survived and how, um, how God was able to use us in, in that circumstance. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you, Rebecca.
and, and so just to kind of tie things up a, a little bit um, in looking at what, what, what Rebecca has shared and then going back to this, this story that this miracle healing of Jesus, I, I think there's some, there's some tie-ins that, 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 that I see um, that really help me in terms of understanding, okay, if I want to make a difference in people's lives, what are the things that I need to be aware of? What, what are the things that I need to begin to, to put in place and to intentionally do? Because if I'm not intentional about how I live my life, things aren't just going to simply happen. And so I heard a phrase uh, a while ago by uh, another pastor in Atlanta named Andy Stanley. And he says this, when making a difference, one of the most important things you need to learn is this. And, and I agree with him. Don't be fair. Be engaged. Don't be fair. Be engaged. And as a parent with kids, that just screams wrong to me. Because we live in a society that talks about the importance of being fair, right? You have little kids, you know when they don't get five, the same amount of french fries as their sibling, that's not fair, that's not fair! And the world seems to say the same thing. But I think one of the perspectives we need to have, and Rebecca shared it, was that when you see the reality and the needs you can quickly become overwhelmed. And you can fall into one or two extremes. The one extreme is I'm just going to shut it out and I'm not going to do anything about it. That this is going to be some sort of a, a coping mechanism for me and, and I'm just not going to engage. The other one, which is typically where people land, is you see the need and you think the need is so great how can I possibly help everyone? And then it's almost like paralysis by analysis. You start to look around and say, well, I, I, there's so much need, there's so much need, and that was one of the greatest dangers in Malawi. I mean, Rebecca said it herself, and, and, and I appreciate her, her honesty about it. Um, I don't always appreciate her honesty when she comments on the way I dress, <laughs> but in this case, I appreciate her honesty. Right? Because sometimes we just want to gloss over the fact of, but she simply said, you know, we couldn't help everyone, and so we want to be engaged. Is that fair? Well, not if you look at it from the perspective of those that weren't being helped. If you look at the story of Jesus' healing, we're given a perfect example of this. You know, oftentimes we read about the healings of Jesus' ministry and think, that is amazing. Jesus arrives on this scene where many, many people are gathering. So I'm just going to throw a number of a couple hundred people who are, who are unable to walk, who are paralyzed, and who are blind. And they're grasping to this, this sense of hope because there is a pool near the temple in Jerusalem that it is believed that an angel would sometimes appear, and when the angel dipped its wings in the water, the water would stir and then the first person into the pool would instantly be healed. Now, we can't, we can't verify that, but something must have been happening because hundreds and hundreds of people who were in need of hope and in need of healing were at this pool. And so Jesus shows up. And Jesus sees this man who for 38 years had been unable to walk. And I would suggest he was not only suffering physically, but emotionally. Because when Jesus speaks to the man, the man says, I have no one. I have no one that can help me get into the water. And so imagine this man, not only physically needing healing, but emotionally needing someone in his life. And Jesus heals the man. He says, stand up, pick up your mat. And the man goes. Now we want to stand back and, and just applaud, right? And say, Jesus, well done. That is outstanding. You know who's not applauding? The hundreds of others that weren't healed that day. I, I don't know about you, but I read this passage and I take a step back and I think, Jesus, that's not fair. That's not fair. Now, why did Jesus choose not 
to heal the others? I, I don't know. I don't know. But I think it reminds us again of the reality. It's not always about being fair. It's about being engaged. Think of any, any ministry, any charity around the world, whether they are a Christian organization or not. They can't help everybody. And so what do you have to do? You have to engage. You have to be willing to step forth and realizing that this is not a problem to be solved, but a tension to be managed. Because if you don't, if you think you're going to help everyone, then the sense of guilt upon you is going to be crippling. And, and I experienced that. I'm sure you've experienced that as well. And so I think one of the, the first steps that I learn, if you want to make a difference, is understand it, it's... This is a tension we live in. It's not always going to be fair, but we're going to be engaged. It's the first thing that I, I, I kind of take away from, from what Rebecca was saying and, and from what we read. The second thing is then look for opportunities. Look for opportunities where, where, where God may be placing you. It may not always be what you expect. But what, what are you good at? How can you connect with coworkers? How can you connect with family? How can you connect within your own community? You see, what's interesting is a lot of the times when we choose to connect with God, he will put us into places we may never have expected or, for being honest again, not necessarily wanted to go. You know, oftentimes, God will kind of twist and turn us into a place, and we're thinking, God, why did you put me here? You know, this, 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 this isn't what I had expected. This, this is kind of hard. This is, this is kind of difficult. But are you looking for those opportunities? You see, that's the second lesson we learn from Jesus, is he looked for opportunities. I, I think if if you read your Bible, and I would highly recommend reading your Bible, look for the details. Look for the details, because there's details that are included for a reason. And there's a perfect example of this. At the very beginning, if we can pull it up on, on the screen, the very beginning, we're told, this is told by John, one of the close disciples of Jesus. And he says, so they go to Jerusalem for the Jewish festivals. Okay, we appreciate that, we know that. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool. Okay, wh why are you telling us about the Sheep Gate? Like, what, what is the point? Now here's three years of seminary for you people, so listen up. Three years of seminary. In Jerusalem, in the temple, there was many different gates. And the different gates would be served for different purposes. There was one particular gate called the Sheep Gate, which was used by those bringing the sheep into the temple for sacrifice. Hence, they call it the sheep gate. Brilliant, eh? You're all thinking, how much do we pay this joker? The point is this. People wouldn't be hanging out at the sheep gate. It would not be the common gate for you to go through. I mean, that's where sheep are. And if you're ever around a lot of sheep, other people don't want to be around you. Right? And so it's not a common place. And so what I think this begins to do, what John is showing us, is Jesus was intentionally looking for opportunities. He went and found these people. He stepped in in order to be engaged. And so the question we have is if we want to be engaged, are we looking for opportunities and are we acknowledging that at times the opportunities that come up may not be our first choice? It may not be what we had thought we should be doing for God. You know, like sometimes we like to tell God, you know, this is, this is what I should be doing, this is, and God's like, I, I think I created you, I think I know better, right? And so are we looking for opportunities and acknowledging the fact that sometimes we'll be placed in challenging spots. Sometimes we'll be placed in situations where it's difficult to overcome because we may never be thanked for what we are doing. Have you ever been there? You're, you're 
busting it to help someone, and it's like they don't even notice. Bit of a churchy answer for you, but here it is. If it can happen to Jesus, it can happen to you. Because we're going to jump to the third slide and just understand the context of this. Jesus just walked up to the man, healed the man, like that, like that. 38 years this guy had not been able to walk. 38 years. And that day, that Sabbath, he's suddenly busting a move, going to the temple with his mat under his arm. And it's interesting, the religious leaders of the day, typical, give the guy a hard time because he's carrying his mat. And you ought to be looking around being like, are you kidding me? The guy is walking. We're not going to touch that one this morning. So, so the religious leaders have a conversation with the guy, and they're like, so uh, who healed you? Who healed you? Like, they're not asking because they want to go and be like, high-five Jesus and be like, this is awesome. They, they, they want to get Jesus in trouble. But I love this. Jesus heals him. And the leaders ask him, who was it that healed you? Maybe the next slide. The man who was healed had no idea who it was. No idea. I don't know. Some guy. Take a moment. Take a moment. You haven't walked for 38 years. You're not going to get the guy's name? Like, really? He doesn't even know who healed him. And then if you keep reading, later on, Jesus is in the temple with this guy, and Jesus has to go up to him and engage him. The guy didn't even look at me. go, oh, yeah, 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 I remember you. Sorry, what's your name? Can you tell me your name? I, I really want to say thank you to you. The guy's like, who are you? Um, the guy who healed you? I don't know. Right? He didn't even, didn't even recognize him. And so that's one of the realities we start to see is oftentimes in making a difference, we find ourselves in the hard places, the places where, where we may not want to go, the places where we may look around and think, is this making any difference at all? Because no one else seems to notice. You, you know who notices? Jesus notices. Matthew tells a, a, a different example in, towards the end of his book in Matthew 25. He says, you know what? When you do it to the least of these, you do it to me. And so every act of kindness, every difference we make is not only helping that person, but Jesus considers that an act done unto him. It starts to change things around. And then the third thing. So be engaged. Look for opportunities. And then ask the person, how can I help you? We go back again to the story of Jesus. Jesus is there. He sees the man who hasn't walked for 38 years. And he asks him, so do you want to be healed? I'm thinking if I'm with Jesus, I'm thinking, okay, we're kind of believing that you're a great prophet. Um, some people believe that you're God. And you're asking this question? You, do you want to be healed? But I think what Jesus is doing is he's engaging the man. He's, he's not making assumptions. And sometimes one of the dangers we make is we assume what people need before we even ask them. Now, often when you ask someone, what is it that, that I can do for you? It's likely going to be what you expected. But one of the greatest things that I have learned is engage people. Ask them. When you, when you say you're going to pray for someone, just ask them, how, how, how can I pray for you? What, what would you like me to pray for? And it is amazing how that begins to open things up. If you're going to help someone, Ask them, how, how can I help you? What, what exactly can I do for you? And I've, I've seen in my own example, oftentimes the, the answer sometimes is what you thought it would be. Other times, it isn't. When you read through the entire Bible, you see this constant theme. This theme of God caring about us so much 
that he will go to whatever lengths it takes to give us hope, to make a difference. So that when we see the difference that Jesus has made in our life, we want that for others. And so we begin acting and engaging in a way that will bring hope into their lives. And so this week, look for opportunities. Look for ways that that you can engage with others and realize you're going to wrestle with the tension that it may not be fair. But don't let that stop you. Allow God to be at work in your life so that you can have an impact upon the lives of others that God brings into you. And when we start to do that, we start to see the greater picture. We start to see the greater reality of what Jesus desires for this world. Not only for our lives, but for this world. But it begins with me, And it begins with all of you. Let us stand together as we sing.